All right, now, in Luke chapter 4, we'll be focusing in on verse number 4. Verse number 4 of Luke 4 says, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, obviously we see here this is the story of Jesus Christ being tempted by the devil. The devil is out in the wilderness and he's casting doubt on Jesus himself and on who he is because that's what the devil does. The devil is someone who's, who's always trying to trick people, trying to deceive people, and to, to get them away from following God. And what he does here, one of, his, one of his great ways of doing that is casting doubt on God's Word, on God Himself, on Jesus Christ. If he can just get people to doubt the truth, to doubt Jesus Christ, to doubt God, then he's got his foot in the door. And that little bit of doubt can go a long way into leading people astray, into leading people away from God, into leading people into sin. When you start to doubt things, when you're not solid, when you're not founded, when you're not firmly planted, when you start to get a little bit of doubt, you start to lean a little bit, you start to get off balance, you start to get off centered, and, and it's easy to get knocked over. The devil's trying to cause doubt here. But Jesus Christ answered him. He says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is why we are a King James Bible only church. And this is important to establish. Now, I've preached a sermon already in the past about the new King James Version. I was comparing that with the King James Version of the Bible. And it's, it's basically the same topic, but I want to lay out a lot of the points here why we are King James Bible only. And it's important to make that distinction. There's a lot of churches out there that say, well, we use the King James Bible. That's what we use in church. But no, we're King James Bible only. We do not think that there is truth and that there's good things and all these other versions of the Bible. They're actually lies straight out of hell, straight out of Satan himself to try to deceive people. And I'm going to go over various reasons. And, and this is a very exhaustive topic. I will not be able to cover everything in depth. There's no way you can do it. There are many, many, many reasons to believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God that's perfectly preserved for us today in 2014. There are many reasons for that. And just for clarification, you know, I don't necessarily think that the King James Bible is the only preserved Word of God today, but it is in the English language. So there, I'm not an a, a, a expert linguist when it comes to various languages. I don't, I don't speak fluently in any foreign languages. I could speak Spanish. I've learned Spanish. But I don't know a lot of different languages, so I can't tell you personally that what languages have the perfect preserved Word of God in them. I don't know, but I'm not saying that they don't exist. Just for clarification, just so that we know that it's not like English is a special language or anything like that, that this is, you know, God has chosen English specifically and no other language is good enough. No, I don't believe that. But I do know that we have God's preserved word for us today who are English-speaking people in 2014. He has kept his word all the way up to the present time. So we're going to go over this. We saw there um, with the devil tempting Jesus, you know, he says, if thou be the son of God, right? Is he saying he's not the son of God? No, not necessarily. I mean, he's implying it. Right? He's questioning it. He's saying, well, if you really are the Son of God, and this is the way the devil works. He, he, he questions things like that. And that's what he did in, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. He says, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden in Genesis chapter 3. He, he's putting doubt. And that's, that's what, one of the reasons why Eve sinned. And she ate of the forbidden fruit. She ate of the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She wasn't supposed to do that, but... The devil came up to her, Satan came up to her in the, in the garden and said, well, did God really say that you can't eat all of all the trees? And started questioning and putting that doubt in there. And when what we have today are a lot of Christians, a lot of people, you know, some of them are saved, some of them are not saved, a lot of people in general who are confused. Amen. They don't understand because 
There is so much doubt. When you go to the, the Bible, a Christian bookstore, you go walk into even a Barnes Noble or any bookstores where you can go and purchase a Bible, what are you going to be hit with? You're going to look and you're going to see an entire row of books. And it's going to say Bibles. And you're going to have the New King James Bible. You're going to have the King James Bible. You're going to have the New International Version. You're going to have New American Standard. You're going to have the Message. You're going to have the Living Bible. You're going to have you know, all of these different versions of the Bible. And there are, to my understanding, there's over 400 different versions of the Bible in English. And they're considered versions of the Bible. And I'll tell you what, my friends, they are not the same. They say different things. Now, this topic is so important. The reason why this topic is so important, if you don't, if you, if you don't understand it already, everything that we believe about God Everything we believe about Jesus Christ and about God comes from this book. It comes from the Holy Bible. It doesn't come from oral tradition. It doesn't come from people and even necessarily from church. It comes from this. This is our source. This is what we rely on. This is what we believe is God's holy words. If I'm going to base everything I believe out of a book, I better make sure I have the right book. When you have 400 different versions to choose from, what's the right one? Is there a right one? And that's what you start to think, well, are any of them even right? I mean, you've got all these different versions. How am I supposed to know? Well, this one says this, and this one says that. What's right? What's true? What is the truth? You'd be like, Pilate, what is truth? Who knows? How can anyone know? And the reason why they're out there is just to cast doubt. Cast doubt on God's word. Is God even capable of preserving his word today? What kind of God is that that can't keep his word around? That says, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But then what is the word of God? This is why this, this subject is so important, so critical. And I know everyone here believes that, but we need to understand why you believe the things that you do. And, you know, this would be a good sermon if, if you, you know, maybe you don't normally take notes, but to take some notes on the back of the, uh, on the, back of the bulletin, I've got a, a section there for you. You can write down some of these verses, these references, because we're going to go through, and honestly, I, I, I compared them to the NIV, it's the easiest and it's the most, um, like it's just the easiest to use one other version to reference in this sermon than to start going through all the different ones. But you'll find out, and it's, it's amazing. And I'm going to get into this in a little bit more detail about why it is the way it is. But the vast majority of, of the references I'm going to show you today, it's not just like that in the NIV. It'll be like that in the New American. You, you look up all these modern versions and the same corruptions that you can find in one version is, is most likely, like 95% of the time, you'll probably find the same corruption in all of the modern versions. And we're, I'll get into the reason for that in a little bit. But I want to start off just by saying, first of all, you know, if we're basing everything on the Bible, we got to make sure we have the right one. You have over 400 different versions. Now, these versions of the Bible that come out, they're all copyrighted. Now, the purpose of the copyright, for one, it's to, it's to ensure that nobody else can steal your words, right? Like, if I author a book, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come up with some novel, right? And I, and I write a big novel, I'm going to say, you know what? This is my creation. I created this. These are my words. I don't want someone else to just copy my same exact story and then sell it and make money. That's, that's the thinking behind the copyright. Okay, that's, that's the purpose of it. Well, I mean, just, just for one, if you're putting, you know, this is supposed to be God's word, not man's word. So the first question is, why are you copywriting it? Why are you saying these are my words and I don't want anybody else to copy these words because they might get money off of it and I want all the money. That in and of itself is wrong. not right. Yeah, it's, not, it's wrong. Exactly. It's, it's not right if it's God's word. I mean, look, I don't, you know, if you want to do that with your own words, fine, whatever. I don't care. You know, that's, I have no 
problems with you wanting to do that. Okay? But when we're talking about God's Word, we're, which we're supposed to publish God's Word, we're supposed to, you know, spread the, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're supposed to try to, to, to reveal God's Word to as many people as possible and to get His Word out there without charging people for it, copyright shouldn't even be an issue. But they do it. And the, the reason why is because the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And you have people who love money. That's why we have some 400 different versions about. Now, do you really think that the, that, the, that the authors of these 400 different versions are all thinking, you know what? All of these other 399 versions, they're all wrong. And I've got it right. And you think that's what they're all thinking. Every single one, you know what? No, I've got it. It's got to be exactly this way. And when you copyright something, it has to be significantly different from another work in order to even copyright it. Now, I have, I have not been able to verify this as truth. I've heard, and I tried looking it up. I had a hard time finding it in the copyright laws. But I did see it at one point, but I didn't see the actual percentage. There is a percentage, though, that, they have to, that different books have to be different from each other by. You know, whether it be 3%, 4%, whatever, like whatever the actual percentage is, they have to be significantly different from each other in order to copyright it. You can't just take, um, you know, let's just pick a novel, A Tale of Two Cities or something, and then just, just switch a few words here and there, and then just copyright it for yourself. You can't just take a couple of words, use a synonym, and then just say, oh, this is mine. It doesn't work like that. They'll say, no. This is not significantly different from this work. You cannot copyright it. They're not different. So in order to copyright these books, even just by copyright law, not even talking about anything scriptural or anything, just, just by copyright laws, you can't have all of these different works unless you're adding some new content. Now, a lot of them may have study Bibles, so you're going to have somebody writing in their own words and their things like that. That's copyrightable. That, that's one of the ways that they do this. That's why you'll have multiple versions of, say, the New International Version because of these study Bibles, prayer Bibles, all, the, you know, all these different things where they add content to it. But I'm just talking about even just the different versions. Okay, they make them, they have to be significantly different from one another, which is different than a revision because you can make a revision of your work without having to get a new copyright for it. You could revise your work, which you would think that, that after all the work that's been done in translation, right into English with with all the scholars that put in their time and their energy and their effort and all the work that they've done and you look at the look at the scholar if you if you've never done this before look up the the individuals who worked on translating the King James Bible look at William Tyndale who's a, who's a predecessor to the King James Bible look at these people look at their credentials and look at how much they've studied look at all the foreign languages that they know okay and for one, compare that to the modern translators. Look at, look at the credentials and just compare them and see who do you think stands out a little bit better. But even besides that, look at them and, and just think to yourself logically, like, does it make sense that we would just have to throw out, throw this out, we need to start from scratch and get a whole new translation? No way. No way. Even if you're someone who thinks, you know what, there's errors in this book. Well, if there's some errors in this book, why wouldn't you just say, okay, let's just revise where the errors are, and then we'll have the Word of God? That would be the honest thing to do, is say, okay, this is right, this is right, this is right, this is right. Oh, here's where it's incorrect. Let's fix that so it's right. Which is, which is essentially what the King James Bible is. It's a revision of the earlier, you know, Tyndale's work, Bishop's Bible. There's, there's a line where they all, they all agree, though, is a thing. It, when, you, when you put those Bibles side by side, there's not much difference at all. Not like there's going to be when we see these ones. I mean, these, these are huge differences and huge errors that we're going to see um, with these modern versions that we have. But with the earlier works, you could put them up side by side and it's, you're reading essentially the same thing. There's some, there were some revisions, there's some changes which you would, you would expect in a work where you're trying to, to get the right thing just small modifications and corrections and say, oh yeah, that wasn't right, but now we're going to correct that compared to the new ones. Now, if you have two books, first of all, let me say this, if you have two books that say the exact opposite, they can't be right. 
And I'm not just talking about here just some synonyms. Turn, if you would, to Hosea chapter 11. In the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets, after all the big books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, right after the book of Daniel, you'll find the book of Hosea. In chapter 11. We're going to see a couple examples. And again, this is I'm, I'm referencing the NIV with these verses. But you'll be able to find these in, in the vast majority of the other new versions. Hosea chapter 11. Look at verse number 12. In the King James Bible, the Bible reads, Ephraim comp compasseth me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God, and is faithful with the saints. So what's he doing here? He's comparing Ephraim and Israel, saying that they're liars, you know, they're straying away from God, they're being deceitful. But Judah, Judah ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. Right? That's, isn't that what that verse is saying there? Pretty simple, pretty clear. In the NIV, Hosea 11, 12 says, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, Israel with deceit. Okay, not, not much different there. But then it says, And Judah is unruly against God, even against the faithful Holy One. Okay, now we have a decision to make. We have two versions of the Bible. We have one that says, Judah ruleth with God and is faithful. We have another one that says Judah is unruly against God and is against the faithful one, the holy, the faithful holy one. Is Judah with God or against God? Okay, those are complete opposites. You can't get any more polar opposite than that. You can't say, oh, well, they're both right. <laughs> no, you, you, that's, that's stupidity. You can't say they're both right. One has to be right and one has to be wrong. You cannot have it both ways. So we have to be able to choose what is right and what is wrong. Now at this point, you know, I haven't given you really enough information to say, yes, the King James Bible is the right one. To this point, we've just established we have different versions out there. We know they have to be significantly different from each other. They don't say the same thing. Yeah, sure, you may be able to find some verses and some portions that you can say, well, yeah, they're basically saying the same thing. I'll give you that. We saw that in the first half of this verse. The first half, fine, no problem. It's basically saying the same thing. But the second half is huge. Now. The question is, what did God really say? The God is the author of this Bible. What does he mean? What is he saying? Is Judah good or bad at this point? It's a very important question. And you can see how this could, I mean, this isn't some minor thing. I mean, this is talking about an entire nation of Judah. Are they being good or evil? It plays a lot of importance in the context. Why would he even bring it up if it's not important? And that's what we saw that we started off with Jesus Christ saying that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, if Jesus is telling us that we have to live by every word of God, but then that every word of God is not available to us, the only way you could live, that we have to live by every word of God, but, but guess what? It's not there anymore. Sorry for you guys in 2014. You don't have every word of God. He wouldn't do that. And every word is important. You can't just, just blow over some stuff and be like, ah, that's not that important. We have, we, that doesn't mean anything to us. No, every word of God is important. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to see the exact same thing. We're going to see polar opposites. Colossians 2 verse 18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So he's saying here, don't let anyone trick you or beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. So this is talking about people tricking you into worshiping angels, right? And, and, and you know, and serving um, angels. It says, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. So basically he's talking about things that he doesn't know about. Right? People who are talking about worshiping angels, all this stuff, they don't know anything about that. They're, they're talking about things they haven't seen. 
And um, it says they're vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. These are things they've made up in their own mind. That's what the verse is saying here. But in Colossians 2.18 of the NIV, you could read your, look down at your Bible, the real Bible, while I read this for you. It says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. In one, in the King James, it's saying what they have not seen. In NIV, it's saying what they have seen. Well, did they see it or have they not seen it? In NIV, it's saying, look, don't let them um, who delights in you know, the worship of angels disqualify you, but they've seen it. Two different things. They're complete opposites. They can't both be true. You have to, we have to be able to decide what is true and what's, what's not true. Now, I've heard some people say that, well, you could find the truth in all of them. And basically, like, you got to read all of these different versions just to, to pick through and then decide what's true and what's not true. They all have errors and they all have truth and you just have to kind of mix them together. That sounds pretty confusing to me. First of all, how do you decide between all of the different versions, you know, this is right and this is right, if you're just looking in English? Like if you're just saying, well, I like the way that this one reads better than this one. That doesn't make any sense. And the Bible also says that God is not the author of confusion. All of these different hundreds of versions of the Bible in English, that's confusing. That casts doubt. God is not the author of confusions. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God wants us unified in what we believe. God wants us to come together as believers and be able to, to hold to the truth and hold to the same doctrines that are found in the truth, that are found in His Word. It doesn't please God to have all of these different believers that believe all different things, which is exactly what's going to happen if you have them all looking at all these different books that are saying different things or going to be believing different things. We need to make sure that we have the truth. And here's the thing. Okay, now we're going to start getting into some, some of the, the promises here. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to Psalm 12. Because God has promised to preserve His Word. Now, if it was completely left up to man, then I can see where man would make mistakes and that there could be errors in there because what man does isn't necessarily, isn't perfect. Okay? But what God does is. And the reason why I believe that God, that, w that we even have a perfect Word of God today is not because I have so much faith in the scholarship of men. Now, there's something to be said for the scholarship, but that's not the only reason why. That is not the reason why I believe that this is the Word of God, because these men were able to do a good job of translating. No. The reason why I believe it is because God Himself has promised to preserve His Word. Preservation means He keeps it. He keeps it in its original state. He keeps it the way that it's supposed to be, all throughout time. It's timeless. It's eternal. It's without end. It's God's word. In um, Matthew 24, 35, the Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. God's word is never going to pass away. It's never going to go away. It's there forever. Psalm 12, look at verse number 6 of Psalm 12. The Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So according to verse 7, who is keeping those pure words? God is. It says, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them. God, you're going to preserve your words. And he says, you're going to preserve them from this generation, the generation of David, where he's writing down this psalm, from this generation forever. Now, if we don't have God's words today, then that just proves that God didn't keep them and that would make this verse a lie. And I don't believe lies. 
I don't believe God's word is a lie. God's word is a truth. He's, he's, he keeps his promises. And if God is doing the preservation, God is the one doing the work. Now, it, it, it baffles me to think people will say, oh, well, I believe that the word of God is true and perfect and everything else in the original autographs, which means that when they were originally written down by the individual, by the Apostle Paul, or by King David, or by these individual men, they say, when it was written down at that time, they were perfect and they were God's word, and that was God speaking through them. They have no problems believing that God can use a human being as an instrument to, to relay his perfect words. Yet, they can't believe that God can use a human being as an instrument to either translate or just copy and maintain his word going forward. Why is that so difficult to believe? When God's already promised in his word to preserve his word from this generation forever, why is it so hard to think that, oh, well, he could only do it the one time when he used that man, but as soon as he did that, then it's just my hands are off and I'm done. And now you guys can just corrupt it and it'll just be screwed up and the, and the farther away from the, the original writings of this word, the more screwed up it's going to get because the more people are going to change it and tamper with it. And I'm just going to leave my hands off. It's, it's foolishness. It's foolishness. God is, we, have, we have the scripture saying that God is promising to preserve his word. Jesus Christ says that we have to live by every word of God. He says his words are not going to pass away. My words shall not pass away. His words are going to be here forever. Isaiah 59, verse 21. Isaiah 59, 21 is another promise. Not just the inspiration of the Bible, but the preservation of the Bible. See, God's word is inspired. It means that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and they spake the words of God. The words of God were penned down as well. But, but they were God's words. It, it, they truly are God's words, not man's word. But Isaiah 59, look at verse 21. It says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. So God's making a covenant, right? He said, this is my covenant. This is my promise, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, Isaiah 59, 21, my spirit that is upon thee in my words, which I have put in thy mouth, so God's saying, I put my words in your mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Did God just say, well, the words that I have put in your mouth are not going to depart out of your mouth, but that's where it ends? No. No. But that's what these people believe. They say when, when we go back to just the original autographs, that's where it stops. But God made the promise. He says, nope, out of your mouth, out of your children's, and out of their children's, and forever. My words will not leave their mouths forever. We have, God's doing the preservation. He made this promise. And he said, this is my covenant. Do you believe God's covenants? Do you believe his promises? Why would you believe in eternal life? Because that's a promise. That's a covenant. If you're going to throw out one covenant, why don't you just throw them all out? God made a promise that his word is going to be around forever. Now, I told you we get into this later and we're getting into it now. Why is it then that we could compare, that when we compare the King James Version of the Bible, we can compare it to all these different modern versions but they all have almost the same corruptions in the same places. The reason why that is, and another reason why we are a King James only church, is because the new versions are based on different manuscripts, different sources for the, the text of the Bible. Now, obviously, the, Eng the, the King James Version is an English translation. It's translated from other languages. They, did, they weren't speaking English at the time of Jesus Christ, you know, they weren't, they weren't speaking that. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, when the Apostle Paul wrote his epistles, they weren't speaking English. So, 
today what we have is a translation from the languages that they were speaking, from, from the Hebrew of the Old Testament, from the, from the Greek, from the, from the Aramaic, from these, these various languages that were being spoken and used when the Bible was originally given, when, when it was originally given out and written down. What we have is a translation from that. Now, I'm not going to get too heavy into detail on the different texts um, that are used because there's, there's lots of different man. I mean, there's like over 5,000 man. They found all of these different manuscripts that they used, that the, that the translators have used uh, throughout history just to, to use as their source for the Bible. Now, um, there's what's called the Textus Receptus, which is basically Latin for the received text, which also includes the, the majority text. So you have the vast majority of the evidence, of the manuscript evidence, agrees with each other. Okay, they agree with one another. When you could you could look up the different renderings, and you know some of these manuscripts are, are just little fragments. They're just a few verses. Some of them are entire books, and everything in between. You you have you have all various degrees. So I, again, you can get really really granular and really detailed into the manuscript evidence. And I've looked into it quite a bit, but for the purposes of this sermon, you know, if you want to look into that a little bit more on your own time, great, go do it. Um, uh, you know, I'd I'd encourage you to do that, but it's not necessary. We've seen so much evidence already, even just from Scripture itself. But um, here's the, you know, the, that's what the the King James uses the Texas Receptus. That all, almost all of. I don't want to be too over encompassing the, in the way I speak, but generally speaking, the new versions come from the Westcott and Hort text, which Westcott and Hort were two men back in the, in the 1800s that, that started using these other um, manuscripts that were found. That a lot of them, or some of them came from Egypt. There's um, Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were, were some of the, you know, the manuscripts that they, they relied on heavily when, when producing what they believe is, is you know, the, the official Greek text that you should use for translating the Bible or for, or for having the Bible in Greek, okay? That's the work that they did. Now, and, and again, there's a lot of attacks on Westcott and Hort as individuals that they were into the occult, and it's probably true. I don't know that for a fact. I don't know that history, that, that, that's, if that's truth or not. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that that is um, for, for sure true, um, but that's, that's what I've read, is that they were in the occult and all this other stuff, but I wouldn't doubt it at all because... Those that corrupt God's word, the Bible says that their place is removed. Let's turn, if you would, real quick to the end of Revelation. Because this is another reason why the Bible versions are so important, because God stresses so much about not tampering with his word and, and, and how extremely important this is in God's eyes. He says in verse 18 of chapter 22 of Revelation, the last chapter of the Bible, he says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So when people come along and decide to say, You know what? We're going to make this new version of the Bible. And by the way, in this new version, this verse is missing, this verse is missing, we're going to add this in here. They're reprobate. They can no longer be saved. Hey, the spot where their name would be in that book of life is gone. He says, I'm going to add my plagues unto you. Westcott and Hort are burning in hell right now for coming, for changing the word of God and for producing this corrupt work that they produced. So to say that if they're into the occult or not, sure, I don't, I don't doubt it. Why wouldn't they be? They're reprobate. They've corrupted the word of God. But the basic theory, 
that, that it's called textual criticism. And, and you know, th there's always these, these fancy words and these real elaborate ways of saying things to make people sound really smart. And you got to get through the mumbo jumbo and their, their long five syllable words when they're really just saying something really basic. The, the vast majority of time when they're, when they're, when they're using these, these real educated words, it is the most simple concept to understand. You say, why do they even have to use that? Why? Because they want you to think that they're really smart and they want you to, to them to have this credibility so that you can say, well, I don't understand what he's talking about, but he must have studied this and he must be smart because he's using these words that I've never heard before and that I don't understand, so I'm just going to listen to what he has to say. Don't get fooled by that. First of all, don't ever get fooled by that. Because once you start to look at this stuff for yourself, when you actually take the time yourself, and you know what people, the reason why people do that is because they're lazy. Because they don't want to look it up for themselves and they're easily deceived. Look, does it take a little bit of work to, to, to research this stuff? And do, yeah, it does. It took me quite a bit of time, even, and I'm not going to get to half of this stuff that I have ready in this sermon. I might, I don't really want to, I might extend it to tonight, but there's just there's so much information here. Don't let people... I, I'll break down this level for you real quick. I'm going to try to get through this a little bit faster. There's basically a few different thoughts in the way that the Bible versions were created. Okay, There's one school of thought that says, well, older is better. The oldest manuscript is the best, the most reliable manuscript. That's one way of thinking. That's what the, the people of the modern versions, because they've unearthed you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and these other manuscripts just recently within the past hundred years that, that say something different than what the other manuscripts have said. You know, and so we're going to say, well, those are older. Those are dated older than all the rest of them. So they must be closer to the truth and they must be right. And this is what we have to use. So now it's like all of a sudden you're going to say, Oh, well, we just found this under a rock. So God's had it hidden, his true word, the real words of God. We just found them now. And for the past, you know, almost 2,000 years, or let's say 1,400 years, 1,500 years, we didn't really know that because it's been hidden. But now all of a sudden we have the truth. Not if God's promise preserve his word forever from this generation forever. That's not true. But um, that's basically the way they think. The other way, which is the way that, that the, the King James was, was made, essentially, is that it's the majority text. So you have, what do the majority of, of the text say? Do they agree with each other? And, and more credence, more reliability is given to that. And the reason is this. That think about this now, because what people always say, I've heard people say this over and over, and you, you've played the telephone game before, right? Where someone says something, you know, you, you say something to one person and they say it to another person and they say it to the other person and they say it to another person. And by the end of the line, what you have isn't the same thing as what you started with, right? Because people hear things different, people make mistakes, and, they, you know, and, and it goes on and on. And I've played this game and I've seen it happen, so I know what they're talking about. But what they say is that with the Bible, that this is what's happened. And now it's just, I mean, there's just tons of errors. And we don't know. And, and what that does is it just cast doubt on the reliability of God's word. But think about this, because that's a stupid example to just say, oh, the telephone game. And, and let's, just, let's just think about a real life example. Let's just, just say, I were to say to you guys, to everybody here in this room, here's the source document in my hand, this one book. You're not going to use your own. We're going to use this book. This is the source. We're all going to make a copy of this. I'm going to make a copy. You're going to make a copy. You're going to make a copy. We're all going to make a copy of this. Now, are we going to make mistakes? Maybe. Probably. You know, I, I, this is a big book. There's a lot of scripture here. There's a lot of copying to do. I might add a word somewhere or repeat a word or leave out a word and miss it or miss a sentence or something like that. Right? I might do that. But if I'm making it, you're making it, you're making it, we're all making this. What is the likelihood from this text that we are all going to make a mistake in the same exact spot? The exact same spot. We, 
Wow, or, or, or even a majority of us. Even, even another person, right? Let's say two people make the same, like not even the same mistake, but just a mistake in the same exact location. What are the odds of that happening? I would say almost none. It's not going to happen. And then to, to give another you know, person the same place to have credibility to say, wow, this is wrong. If we want to know the exact truth of behind this text, what we do is, okay, we've got five versions of the Bible. Now, five copies, I mean, not versions, five copies from this text. Well, if we want to know what this text says, we could compare all five copies. And we'll say, oh, wait, these four copies say this, and this one says this, this one must be wrong. Right? These four copies say this, in this area, well, this one must be wrong. And you can correct it. It's a very easy way of doing it, right? I mean, and it makes sense. Now, with the Bible, another thing to consider is that this isn't just some game. It's the Word of God. Now, if, if like, like when we do the Bible memorization, I know that I spend a lot of time making sure that I get all of the words right because I know that every word of God is important. I don't just, just haphazardly memorize and then say, well, whatever, it's close enough. No, I'm very diligent to make sure that I get these words right. And that's important to me. And if I was going to be making a copy of the Bible, I would also be very diligent about that, much more diligent than, say, any other thing that I might want to be copying. I am going to pay extra attention to God's words to make sure I get this right because this is important. Now, when they were making the copies then, it was going to be for churches to use or for people to use of God's word. That's an important task. Now, does that mean that every single person doing the copying was always really focused and, and considerate that this is a very important work? Not necessarily, but I bet you a lot, most of them were. Even if there were some people doing copying that didn't care that much, Okay, they might produce some bad copies, but overall, when you're trying to get the Word of God out, there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of focus and diligence given to the copies being made. Are there going to be mistakes in some of the copies? Sure, I don't doubt that there were. There are. There are. We have the manuscript. We have evidence showing that there were mistakes made in some of the copies. But when you have the... I mean, we don't have the originals, but... We can see that, that um, you know, when there's a lot of copies made, you can look at the majority of them when they're coming from the same source and to be able to determine where they are. And that's basically the mindset of, of, of how the, the King James Bible was, was compiled and put together as to what these are the right words. Because you have thousands of texts to choose from. And you have translations into different languages as well to help you along and say, oh, well, these... And, and I don't even want to get into, there's so much stuff to get into. Because people will come up with these, with these arguments that are fake. Or they're worded in such a way that, yes, what they're saying might be true, but they're not giving you the full, the full knowledge, the full truth. So, like, they'll say, this is the oldest document. Maybe in Greek. This is the oldest manuscript. Maybe in Greek, but not in another language. Not in uh, Syrian, not in... Not in um, you know, some, some of these other languages that were created then, that were, where we already had the Bible translated from early, early times, the New Testament, because it went out everywhere. I mean, there were churches springing up all over the place, and people wanted the Word of God in their language, and, I mean, the apostles were able to, to speak with other tongues. There's no reason to think that the Bible wasn't preserved in other languages as well back then. But, um, anyways, to say that older is better is foolish... People have been trying to corrupt God's word. And here's the other thing to, to consider. You say, oh, well, we found, and it's funny because the oldest, the oldest manuscripts that they find are still like over a hundred years past when they would have been written anyways. A hundred years, that's a long time. I mean, that's like, that's a really long time to go before you say, well, this is the oldest one, so this must be the best. If you're relying on the oldest, you don't have that close to the original. I mean, ultimately. There's a long time that has passed in between. But um, even back then, people have always been trying to corrupt God's word. We know that Satan's always casting doubt on God's word. From the Garden of Eden with Eve to Jesus Christ, when he was being tempted, he's casting doubt. That's what he does. He's a great deceiver. 
He cast out. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And that's why also Paul, in, in Paul's letters, he would say like, you know, um, people would write letters as from us. So people are trying to imitate like a letter from the Apostle Paul. People are trying to corrupt his words and people are thinking that that might be scripture. Th this stuff has been going on even back then. So let's say you found a manuscript from one of these false prophets or people who are trying to corrupt God's word. Just because it's older does not make it by any means, any way, shape, or form better than what's been traditionally used by the church. And then think about this too. I don't know about you, but my Bibles, they are, they get used. They get worn out. I go through Bibles depending on the Bible and how nice it is and stuff. Every one to two years, I'm getting a new Bible. Because Why? Because I go bring it with me. I go talk to people. I go so wanting. I open it up and read it, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I, you start flipping through the pages, they're going to eventually get ripped and torn and worn out. And when you use things, they get worn out. So if you're looking for really, really, really old Bibles, well, you're going to have to find one that wasn't used. And if it wasn't used, was it not used for a reason? Is it not used because like the Vaticanus was found in a Catholic church in the trash can? One of the manuscripts used in the modern versions today was found in a trash can in the Catholic church. Literally. I'm not, I'm not even making that up. That is something that has been verified as being true. That is where they get their garbage doctrine from, from their garbage Bible versions from a garbage dump. Things that are, are cast aside and put as, as trash are probably trash for a reason, right? The true word of God gets used. The churches are going to be using it. They're going to be, you know, you're, you're going to have to, you're going to make copies of it, but you're going to need to continue to make copies as time goes on because the older ones are just going to be used to, to the point where they're not usable anymore. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. The Bible says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. He's saying even back then, there were many people which are corrupting the word of God. Many people. Not one person, not two people. There's many people corrupting the word of God. So you find some old manuscript. How do you know that's not one of the many that was corrupting the word of God? Just because it's old doesn't mean it's better. You have to look at what was received, what was received by the church. What were the churches using and has been passed down through the churches all the way up until today? Because that's where you're going to find your answer. And what's ironic is that that verse that we just read, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. <laughs> Do you know what that says in the NIV? It says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. You know what the word peddle means? It means to sell. It says, we don't sell the word of God for profit. Is that what it says here? No, it says corrupt the word of God. So, in their corruption, they changed corrupt to peddle, to, you know, to selling. And what's even more ironic is, what is the NIV doing? They're selling it for a profit. They're saying this is the word of God and we're selling it for a profit because we've got the copyright on this thing. Unbelievable. All right, we're almost done. God's word is without error. The Bible says in Proverbs 35, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. We saw that in Psalm 12 as well. God's words are pure words, as silver purified seven times. They're right. I mean, think about silver being purified in an oven. You get the impurities out seven times. I mean, you're, when you purify something seven times, like that, you get all the dross out, you get, you get the impurities out, you are going to be left with pureness. I mean, there's going to be nothing impure that's left in that at all seven times. But that's how, that's these, these 
using that analogy with God's word. Saying God's word is like silver tried in a furnace seven times. And his, that's how pure his word is. The Bible says every word of God is pure. It's truth. It's, it's, um, it's without error. If, God's, if you have a book and you're going to call it God's word, but then there's problems, there's errors, there's mistakes, my friend, that is not God's word. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't contradict himself. God doesn't say two things that are just completely different and opposite and say that they're both true. That's not God's word. And the other, another reason why this is so important, the Bible says that, or, yeah, the Bible says that Jesus is the word. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it says in John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He's the Word of God made flesh. If you have a different Word, if you have a different Word of God, you have a different Jesus. The NIV, different Jesus. The New American Standard, different Jesus. The New King James, different Jesus. They're different words. They say different things. That's not the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. The words contained in this book is Jesus. Because Jesus is the embodiment of the Word. People that will defend the corrupt versions will tell you that the changes don't affect doctrine. And I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to close this out. I'm not going to continue this tonight. But there is lots of doctrine affected. Luke 2 is, I'm just going to blow through these and just read them for you. You don't have to follow them if you don't want to. You could turn through them. I'll give you this list at the end if you want. I've got it printed off here. Um, I'll just do some of the highlights of the major changes and differences that are made in the new versions versus the King James Bible. And you could at least see for yourself that there are some serious differences between between the new versions versus the King James. And if you still are not convinced that the King James Bible is the truth, continue looking at some of these because you cannot look at both of these and say, well, that doesn't really matter or I don't know. I mean, you have to see, you have to make a decision. You have to choose what's right, what's true, and what's not true. Uh, for example, in the, in the NIV, in Luke chapter 2, it refers to Joseph. Instead of saying Joseph, it says, uh, and his father and mother. It calls Joseph Jesus' his father when the King James Bible is very, very, very careful to never call, refer to Joseph as Jesus' his father because God is Jesus' his father. Joseph was not Jesus' his father. If, you want, if anything, he's his stepdad. But even that, you know, I, I kind of balk at anyways because he was married to Mary and he helped to raise Jesus, sure, Physically, but, but Joseph was not Jesus' father. And the King James is very clear about that. And I've had someone tell me this before, too. You might hear someone say, oh, well, no, the King James calls Joseph Jesus' his father. And they'll use phrases like that. Well, the King James calls him. No, the King James doesn't call Joseph Jesus' his father. Mary calls Joseph Jesus' his father. And the King James records that because that's exactly what Mary said. But what's interesting is that after she says that, Jesus rebukes her. And it's in Luke 2.48. It says, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So did Mary say that? Yes, she did. That's not the King James calling Joseph Jesus his father. That's Mary calling Joseph Jesus his father. Because that's exactly what she said. And for the King James to have anything else written there would be a lie if that's exactly what she said. So the King James isn't going to change it to say, oh, no, no, she meant Joseph. No, but she said, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing, which is why Jesus responded and said, and he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? She said, my, yo, your, father, my father, your father and I have sought you. I was about my father's business, Mary. Not Joseph's business. My father. That's how he responded to her. The, uh, the, the verse about the Trinity in 1 John 5, 7, gone from the new versions, where the Bible says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Very, the, the most clear verse you could, you could find on the Trinity. Now, it doesn't mean the doctrine doesn't exist anywhere else in the Bible. It does. But that is the most powerful, the most clear verse gone from the new versions. They just, that just doesn't exist. 
Bible says, um, you know, Philippians 4.13, a very famous passage, I can, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Right? A lot of people have that memorized. Great verse, very powerful. Um, new version say, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Who is that? Who's him who gives me strength? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Doesn't say anything about Christ. It just says him. That could be anybody. That could be, I don't know. You know, it could be your, your pastor for all I know. Um, 1 Timothy 3.16. You know, um, without all controversy, great is the mystery of God. God was manifest in the flesh. Another great soul winning verse I like to use. A lot of great verse I like to show to Jehovah's Witnesses and the people that explain that, look, God became a man. God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Well, in the new version, it says, Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. Now, first of all, does that, I mean, is that easy to read? Does that sound like it's easy to follow? Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. He, who? Who appeared in the flesh? It just says, he appeared in the flesh was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed in the world, was taken up into glory. When I read that, I would say, oh, well, Jesus appeared in the flesh. He appeared in the flesh. That's what the new version say. Instead of God was manifest in the flesh. Major difference there. The Bible says um, <laughs> in Mark 10, 24, it says, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Talking about those that are, that are relying on being wealthy to, to make it into heaven. The new version says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. All of a sudden, just making salvation difficult. If you're trusting in riches, is it hard to get into heaven? Yeah, you better bet it is, because you ain't going to make it. But is it hard to enter into the kingdom of God? No, it's just by putting your faith in Christ. It's not hard at all. It's actually very easy. The new versions make it hard. They omit um, Act 8.37 when he says, you know, see here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Gone from the new versions. That answer, the response of Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And um, I've got more and more. Come and see me. After. I'm going I'm to wrap it up because we're... I've kind of gone a little bit over time. And this is such an expansive topic. There's so many things to cover. There's so many verses that are, that are changed. Um, they, the new versions call, they actually remove the word Lucifer. So if you know who Lucifer is, the only reason you know who Lucifer is is because of the King James Bible. The new versions just completely remove any reference to Lucifer, so you wouldn't know who he was. Not only do they remove the reference, but they replace that reference of Lucifer with the morning star. Now, in the Bible, the morning star refers to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And even in the new versions, you can see where the morning star refers to Jesus Christ. So, inherent to their own translation, you have contradictions. You have Jesus Christ being cast out of heaven in Isaiah 14. Because the new versions call um, uh, Lucifer the morning star. Man, there's so many verses, but uh, let's, just, let's just wrap it up with this. Um, I've got so many here, but I'm, I'm going to call it quits. <clears throat> so don't let anyone... I, I know everybody here is on the same page with us on believing the King James Bible is the Word of God. There are so many reasons to believe why God has preserved His Word. We've seen it from Scripture. There's so many reasons to believe why this is the right versions. You could compare the versions among themselves. When you see contradictions within a book, that's not God's Word. This book has no contradictions in it. I have seen people try to come up with contradictions, and every single one of those contradictions has been answered. I have no problems with anyone coming to me and trying to say, oh, well, no, there's contradictions here. Now, will I always have an answer 100% of the time? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe there's something I don't quite understand because I don't understand every single thing about the Bible, but I bet somebody else does. Because every time I've ever seen, any question I've ever seen on the Bible, I've, I've, I've had a very sufficient answer um, either from someone else or from, or from my own reading of just looking at it and saying, well, no, this is what the Bible's saying. It's, very, you know, it's clear enough. It's not, it's not a contradiction. Um, 
We need to make sure that people understand this great truth, um, especially when we go out and win souls. When you talk to people who either are already saved or who are just gotten saved, that they are very clear that they start reading and, and learning from this book because this is the book of truth. This is what's going to help a person to grow spiritually. This is what we need to be reading. Not any of the other books that are out there that are corrupted because you can't get a good thing out of, out of something that's corrupted. Uh, the good tree produces good fruit, an evil tree produces wicked fruit. And this is the good tree. This is the truth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for preserving your words for us today. God, I pray that you would please just help us to, to let other people know about this important truth and this important doctrine, dear Lord. And um, Lord, continue to teach us from, from your words, from the truth, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.